Chapter six of the gentle art of faking by Riccardo Noboli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter six Decadence of Art and Consequent Changes. Decadence of Art and Consequent Change in the Artistic Milieu. Byzantine Art. Its new views do not seem to favour old ways. Art patronage and collector mania tend to disappear. The medieval period. Character of the collections. No imitators, but a few forgers. The change affecting the world with the decadence of the Roman Empire was logically bound to stamp the successive course of art with the inevitable downfall of past glory. With the Christian era, a new society had arisen, and also a new art, entirely symbolic, no more satisfied with the early plagiarisms, apparently lisping a new tongue, but ready to dispel all pagan sentiment in art, to establish the elements of a new expression and purpose more in harmony with the reborn civilization. With an art that Taine considers, after five centuries, to be unable to represent man except seated or standing erect, symbolic and calligraphic at the same time, there seemed to be no room for amateurs and collectors of the old type. There may have been sporadic cases, though Constantine's secure censure of all the cults of the past doubtless made it a daring act at that time to profess worship for old traditions in art. Collector mania very likely became a thing of the past. There must have been dealers in art and antiques, as we can gather from the digest, and transactions between artists and clients, as can be seen from a clause of the Justinian laws, but nothing like there were in the ancient Roman world that had been dispersed by the new civilization. This clause Justinian was forced to add to a law and artistic property, as judges had so lost all sense of art appreciation that in a dispute between a painter and the man who had furnished the board on which the work was painted, they decided that the painting belonged to the one who owned the board. Justinian was forced to do justice by stating that if a quarrel arose between the artist and the one who furnished the board, the owner of the work was the artist as the value of the board could not be compared with the artistic one. Think, he concludes, of comparing the value of the work of Apelles or Parhasius with the price of a board of very small value. The time for lovers of art, for private speculations, and the all but consequent faking, and all the characteristic figures of an art market, has disappeared. In the early medieval period, there seems to have been no scope for faking and forgery. The collector, if the type then existing is entitled to the name, was like nothing that had been seen before or has since appeared. The objects treasured generally had more intrinsic value than real artistic merit. A collection represented a simple form of banking, a sound and good investment taking the place of what the French call personal property. With such views, goldsmith's work, studded and ornamented with precious stones or rich embroideries in gold, naturally had the preference. Articles of vertu then had a strong value, and while suitable for princely display, could be turned into money at any moment. The craze for manuscripts, rare penmanship, and early illustrated parchments may represent an exception, but only, apparently, as such objects, apart from their rarity, skill, and supreme patience in miniature work, were of such an established value to be regarded like precious gems. The medieval collections of art and precious things give a true expression of those unsafe and uncertain times and were in harmony with the erratic career of the monarchs and potentates whose peculiar mode of life often necessitated the packing of the whole museum into a coffer and dragging it with them in their pilgrimages, wars, etc. This not only in some way explains the preference given to goldsmith's work, but the fact that the dimensions of sculpture had to be reduced, and painting, when not for church decoration, was mostly restricted to miniatures, illumination, and designs for tapestries and embroideries. Clovis, the most Christian king, 
as Pope Anastasius called him, is supposed to have been an eager collector of rare and precious objects. Tradition claims that a saint one day broke one of his rarest cups of jasper, all studded with precious stones, and seeing Clovis's sorrow at such a loss, picked up the fragments and praying over them, performed a miracle, handing to the monarch the cup restored to one piece as before. Clotaire, the son of Clovis, had in his mansion at Brain a secret room with chests full of jewellery and precious vases. Chilperic had a real ambition to collect rare objects of virtu. For this purpose he sent everywhere for all that might be worthy of his collection. Gregory of Tours tells us that he had a Jew as adviser, a man called Priscius. It is said that when Chilperic exhibited at nogent sur marne the presents offered him by the emperor tiberius the second to show that they did not surpass in splendour the best pieces of his own treasure he exhibited close to them one of his precious cups a golden vase studded with rare stones and weighing fifty pounds twenty years later between five sixty and five eighty saint redigond the daughter of the king of thuringia received the poet and canon fortunatus in her covenant of poitiers and gave him a dinner with the table covered in roses and the richest ornamented silver plates and precious jasper cups such a treat inspired the poet with one of his fine latin poems dagobert was not only an enlightened collector of precious things but so extremely fond of artistic vessel that when Sissinand, a Gothic king, wished to induce the Frankish monarch to join him in his political schemes, he promised Dagobert a fine gold plate weighing five pounds, and more precious still for the beauty of the workmanship. After a long lapse of time, in which the only museums of the art of the time seem to have been the churches, under Charlemagne and his successors, private collections of treasures, art and fine pieces of work again seem to acquire importance the bibliothèque nationale of paris owns an evangeliaire of rare artistic value illuminated by a monk named godescal in the year 781 the bible and psalter of charles the bald are said to have been the work of the monks of saint martin de tours and are considered a marvel of illumination Together with these books, now held in the Livrerie Nationale of Paris, Charles presented to the Church of St. Denis a famous cup known in his time as Ptolemy's Cup, a fine work carved from a piece of precious sardonyx. In the will of this monarch's brother, the Marquis of Friuli, a document dated 870 there is among other legacies the enumeration of arms studded with precious stones clothes in silk and gold embroideries silver vases and ivory cups finely chiselled and a library in which among other notable works are the writings of saint basil saint isidore and saint cyprian from this time forward a collection of rare things and precious jewels is quite a necessary appanage of kings and princes but as we have said it mostly consisted of small objects in which art almost invariably seems to have played a secondary role and in considering the art it is often hard to know whether to admire more the miniaturist's patience or his workmanship later on the cult of pagan art seems to have been revived by the emperor frederick the second the son of barbarossa but even at this time the case is somewhat of an exception under patrons of art who were as a rule absolute monarchs or iron rulers and all-powerful princes fakery would have played a dangerous and most sorrowful part nor was there any inducement to indulge in any of the trickery that had characterized the world of lovers of art during the roman decadence a risky game at any time it might have entailed one of those exemplary punishments which characterized the ferocious middle ages coin counterfeiting was naturally the least artistic form of deceit and being a less hazardous venture seems to have tempted ability in all ages 
it represents a link between more proficient periods of art swindling. Some of these early fakers certainly planted the seed from which sprang the arch deceivers and clever medalists of the Renaissance. There lies Romina, where I falsified the alloy that is with the Baptist stamped, for which on earth I left my body burned. These words Dante puts into the mouth of Mastro Adamo da Brescia, a skilful counterfeiter of coins whom he met in hell. Adamo was burned at the stake near the castle of Romina, in the Casentino, for having cast by order of the Count of Romina, the gold florin of the Florentine Republic. About this time, counterfeit coining tempted the most diverse classes of people. It had a long list of devotees, including even a king of France, who honoured the Republic of Florence with not a few of his swindling specimens of the golden florin. Marostica, a village in the Venetian domains, challenged and defeated the powerful republic of the lagoon by flooding the Venetian market with the most deceptive samples of false coinage. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 7. The Renaissance Period. Initiation of the Renaissance Period. Newly born passion for the antique. The Mycenas and the Collector. Plagarians, imitators and fakers. Cola de Rienzi, archaeologist. A collection of the 14th century. Artists, writers, and travellers hunting for antiques. Niccoli, the Medicis, Cardinal Scarampi, and others. The Medici collection dispersed by the Florentine mob. The Renaissance fakers of art have a somewhat nobler pedigree when compared with those of other epochs. The early artists from whom they sprang were not actual imitators of the Greeks and Romans, but were inspired by them to reproduce that pagan expression which had deeply affected their artistic temperament. Were these artists doing it purely for art's sake, or had they the hope that their work might pass as antique? The answer to this is perhaps to be deduced from the character of the age not yet fully ripe for artistic deception. The sentiment for, and cult of, the antique were certainly growing during this early part of the Renaissance. They did not come in a sudden burst, but had been gradually developing in the previous years. As a matter of fact, already in the transitional period, which prepared the highest artistic accomplishments of the Renaissance, collections and collectors were becoming not only eclectic in taste, but seemed to have been guided by a real artistic fondness for the art of the past. It is no more a question of solid silver and jewels, but of statues and paintings. Catalogues no longer read like that of Charles VI of France, Inventoire des joyaux, Vaisselle d'or et d'argent estant au Louvre et en la Bastille à Paris appartenant à Fulle Rochal, followed by a monotonous enumeration of jewels, vaisselle, etc., but are like that of the Medici collection, and include all the most varied expressions of art, sculpture, paintings, medals, carvings, cameos, rare jewels, etc., in the early part of the 14th century, we know that Cola de Rienzi, the Roman tribune, collected inscriptions. One of his biographers tells us that Cola occupied himself every day with inscriptions cut into marble, which were to be found round Rome. No one could decipher the ancient epitaphs like him. He translated all the ancient writings and gave the right interpretation to these marbles. It was between the years... 1344 to 47 that Cola compiled a work of Roman inscriptions, re-edited a century later by Signorelli in his Descriptio Urbis Romae. Oliver Forza, or Forzetta, who flourished about the year 1335, seems to have owned the first complete collection of which we have notice.
Forzetta was a wealthy citizen of Treviso. We know that in the above year of 1335 he came to Venice to buy several pieces for his collection, manuscripts of the works of Seneca, Ovid, Sallust, Cicero, Titus, Livius, etc., goldsmith's work, 50 medals that had been promised him by a certain Simon, crystals, bronzes, four statues in marble, others representing lions, horses, nude figures, etc. The latter seems to have belonged to an earlier collector named Perenzolo. To point out that even outside Italy, taste had changed at the beginning of the 15th century, we may quote the following description, handed down to us by Gilbert de Metz. It gives a full account of the collection of Jacques Ducci, a Parisian, and indicates that at this early time Paris must have possessed more than one of these collections of art and curios. The house of Master Ducci in the Rue des Prouvelles, says Gilbert de Metz, the door of which is carved with marvellous artistry. In the courtyard there were peacocks and diverse fancy birds. The first hall is adorned with diverse pictures and instructive texts fixed to and hung on the walls. Another hall filled with all manner of instruments, harps, organs, viols, guitars, psalters and others, upon all of which the said Master Jacques knew how to play. Another hall was furnished with chess tables and other diverse kinds of games, great in number. Item, a beautiful chapel where there were stands to place books upon, marvellously wrought, which had been sent from diverse places far and near, to the right and to the left. Item, a study, the walls of which were covered with precious stones and with spices of sweet odour. Item, several other rooms richly furnished with beds and with ingeniously carved tables and adorned with rich hangings and cloth of gold. Item, in another lofty room were a great number of crossbows, some of which were painted with beautiful figures. Here were standards, banners, pennons, bows, pikes, swords, lances, battle-axes, iron and lead armour, pave, shields, bucklers, cannon and other engines with arms in abundance and briefly there were also all manner of war implements item there was a window of wonderful workmanship through which you put a hollow iron mask through which you could look out and speak to those outside if occasion arose without making yourself known item above the whole house was a square room with windows on every side from which one could overlook the town and when it came to eating food and drink were sent up by a pulley because it would have been too high up to carry and above the pinnacles of the house were beautiful gilt figures this master jacques ducci was a handsome man de honest ebit and very distinguished he kept well-mannered and well-trained servants of pleasing countenance, among whom was a master carpenter who was constantly at work at the mansion. But Italy at the early part of this century was far more advanced. There was no question here of collectors of dubious taste or odd fancy for the simply curious. On the contrary, we are confronted by real connoisseurs and genuine lovers of art, intelligent and eager hunters after all sorts of articles of virtu of past art, and also enlightened art patrons who were munificent towards their contemporary painters, sculptors and literary men. Taste had changed, and some tendencies merely outlined at the time when religion seemed to absorb all the activities of art were now in full growth. That which in the art of the Cosmati appeared to be a Byzantine aping Roman art, all that seemed plagiarism of this classic art in Nicola Paisano, takes an interestingly different course with Donatello, Brunellesco, and all those artists whom a wrong convention calls the forerunners of the renaissance instead of calling them the real creators of that great artistic movement the passion for the antique was reviving it was no longer a question of sporadic cases but rather of a wide-spreading taste roman art was in the air besides rienzi this cult of antique memories had already claimed his friend petrarch and the learned dondi 
a physician from Padua, who visited Rome in the year 1375 to crown a long course of study devoted to the antique. In a letter addressed to his friend Guglielmo da Cremona, Giovanni proclaims the superiority of antique art and is certain that modern artists will be the first to recognise the fact and learn from it. Poor and hard-working, Dondi regrets that his profession, his ailing patients, take so much of his time. But for the profession, I would rise as high as the stars, he naively declares. Chirieco d'Ancona, another great eager collector and intelligent hunter after fine things, visits the Orient and Greece in search of manuscripts and relics of art. Francesco Squarcione comes from the east, bringing to his native Padua fine Greek works, and is perhaps the first artist to devote himself to antiques, just as Niccolò Niccoli, a Florentine lover of art, represents at this time the learned amateur of taste. Niccoli is really one of the finest types of collectors. Born at a time when Florence demanded that each citizen should belong to one or other of the factions that kept civil war alive in the city, he nevertheless managed to keep free from all civil strife. His house was the temple of art and of neutrality. A friend of the powerful and wealthy Medicis, who, by the way, trusted to his infallible eye as a connoisseur whenever rare things were offered. Niccoli never took advantage of this unusual position, but kept himself far from all ambition, and was possessed by the sole desire to collect art, study old manuscripts, and be an ever-obliging helper to students. The friends and admirers who came in flocks for advice, to borrow his rare manuscripts, or to visit his fine emporium of art, were always well received. Niccolò Niccoli was born in the year 1363. The son of a rich Florentine merchant, he was forced in his youth to give all his activities to commerce. Liberated from the tie of a profession for which he had no call, he finally gave himself to his cherished study of art and literature, attending the lessons of Luigi Marsigi and Emmanuel Chrysoloras. His studies were thus the stepping stone to the collecting of antiquities. In the year 1414, his fame had already extended beyond the city walls. The Chancellor of the city of Padua addressed him in a letter as Clarissimus Vetustatis Cultor. Notwithstanding his great wealth, such was his passion that but for the discreet help of the Medici, the powerful Cosimo and his brother Lorenzo, who became Niccoli's benevolent bankers, on more than one occasion this enlightened amateur might have been forced to sell his precious collection, or at least do that which is most hateful to the true lover of art, sell the best that years of patient work had gathered together. What is most surprising is the fact that Niccoli managed to make one of the finest collections of art of his day, almost without leaving his native city. We know of him as going once to Padua to secure a rare manuscript of Petrarch, and later on as accompanying his friend and protector Cosimo Medici to Verona, a trip the latter undertook in the year 1420. With Cosimo again he visited Rome, to be horrified at the mutilation inflicted upon the Eternal City by barbarians of all ages and denominations. Yet, without moving from his native city, keen-eyed Niccoli managed to search the world with the help of agents and friends, some of them, no doubt, the practised servants of the Medicis. There was hardly a rare thing discovered, no matter where, but the fact came to Niccoli's ears, and the find generally found its way to this enlightened Florentine's collection. Once he even had the fortune to discover a fine sample of Greek art in Florence, a few steps from the door of his house. It was the well-known cameo which he attributed to Polycletus, and which was afterwards so often reproduced by the artists of the Renaissance. Niccoli discovered this rare piece of chalcedony hanging around the neck of a street urchin. He asked him who his father was and found him to be a poor workman. He went to see him, and to the man's surprise offered for the stone the round sum of five golden ducats. 
it is curious to trace the migrations of Niccoli's Calcedonio, as the piece was later called. When Cardinal Scarampi, the patriarch of Aquileia and the most passionate collector of his time, came to Florence, he went to visit Niccoli and his collection. There he became so enamoured by the Calcedonio that he promised to buy it. Niccoli, who could hardly refuse the favour to the powerful and influential cardinal, consented to part with the rare piece for 200 ducats. Later on, the Calcedonio entered the collection of Pope Paul II, to pass finally to that of Lorenzo il Magnifico. In an inventory belonging to the Medici family, the gem is valued at 1,500 golden florins. Not dissimilar from certain modern and older types of collectors, Niccoli was what might be called a strange character. While spending large sums of money on his articles of virtu, he was almost parsimonious in his household, although he liked to drink from rare cups and set his table most richly with all sorts of precious vases. One of his peculiarities was always to be dressed in pink. He had an endless wardrobe of these rosy-hued garments and was as preoccupied with them as he was with the rare objects of his collection. These and other oddities were naturally the subject of jibes and sarcasm from friends and unfriendly humanists, but Niccoli never answered one written line, content to retaliate with his witty and cunning tongue. He certainly had the best of it in this curious duel, for he forced Aripsa and Philelphe to leave the town, and also, perhaps not through his sarcastic tongue alone, but through some Medician intrigue, compelled his enemies, Emmanuel Chrysoloras, his former teacher, and Garino, to make themselves very scarce in the city. Niccolo Niccoli's name brings us straight to that of his protectors, the Medicis, the family who, as collectors of art and fosterers of literature and philosophy, surpassed every one of their age. Cardinal Scarampi's collection, that of Pietro Barbe, afterwards Paul II, and even the most complete of all, that of Niccoli, become rather minor stars when compared with the artistic treasures gathered by the Medicis for generations. This illustrious Florentine family seems to have been for centuries nothing but a succession of patrons of the fine arts. No art collection, says Eugene Muntz in his Les Collections des Medici, has more deeply influenced the art of the Renaissance. No collection has passed through more trials than the one of this family. Ten generations of enthusiastic amateurs have given themselves to its enrichment. The greatest artists, Donatello, Ghiberti, Verrocchio, the two Lippi, Ghilandaio, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo and Raphael have sought inspiration and models in the Medici collection. This while, by an unaccountable contradiction, all the revolutions that troubled the city of Florence seem to have continually threatened the existence of such an inestimable gathering. To be convinced of the extreme importance of the Medici collection, one has but to reflect that what now remains of it in the Florentine museums or in well-known private hands is only the smallest part of those past treasures, which has managed to survive the pillage of the collection in the year 1494, when Piero Medici fled, and the Medici palace was sacked by the populace and the remaining effects sold and dispersed by order of the commune. What was later recovered by the family was only a small part of the collection. An idea of the magnitude of the Medici Museum of Art can be gained by perusing the accurate inventories still remaining in the Florentine archives. The list of the objects left by Cosimo the Elder to his son Piero and the catalogue of the collection belonging to Lorenzo il Magnifico and finally the account of their money. A brief study of the character of the two most important collectors of the Medici family, Cosimo and Lorenzo il Magnifico, will enable us to judge the quality and tendencies of the amateur of the Renaissance. The characteristics of the time in which Cosimo lived 
and the fact that he had spent a long period in exile gave his inclinations as an amateur a different course from what they might otherwise have had thus while on the one hand cosimo never lost a chance to help artists and to acquire fine works of art he was shrewd enough to do so without ostentation to avoid arousing enmity from adversaries but for this peculiar feeling cosimo's palace the present palazzo riccardi one of the most sumptuous monuments of florence might have been still more imposing displaying greater architectural wealth it is known that Brunelleschi's project was privately preferred by Cosimo, but he did not dare to arouse old jealousies by too sumptuous a display. Michelozzo's design was chosen as the more modest of the two, and thus better fitted for the bourgeois prince of Florence. Notwithstanding the necessity for caution, even in liberality, Cosimo encouraged Poggio Bracciolini and many others in their intelligent search for manuscripts and rare parchments. He had Niccoli as an invaluable adviser and helper, and left to his son Piero one of the finest collections of antiques. His grandson, Lorenzo il Magnifico, was more free-handed times had changed the medici family though without heraldic title was now master of the city and the splendours of a man of taste such as lorenzo and his prodigal inclinations knew no restraint whatever the difference between cosimo and lorenzo lay perhaps in the fact that the former could not do half what he might have done comparing niccoli and lorenzo one might say that the former tallied more with the modern interpretation of the word collector while the latter as being far too eclectic a lover of all sorts of artistic expression was more cut out for the part of an enlightened mecenas a prince amateur and a generous patron of art and literature one can hardly even imagine the magnifico classifying his cameos as did niccoli or giving a semi-scientific and rational order to his objects of virtu but running on the same lines as cosimo lorenzo invested in the role of patron of art and lover of the antique in which he displayed such magnificence as to fully deserve his appellation such was the character of these two medicis stated by contemporaries as being more greedy for fame than money an estimation fully justified especially in the case of lorenzo who in his recordi notes that his father and grandfather spent six hundred and sixty three thousand seven hundred and fifty five florins in the space of thirty years and rejoices in the fact the sum quoted amounts to rather more than a million francs how many modern heirs would feel like lorenzo il magnifico like niccoli and cosimo lorenzo possessed the excellent quality most uncommon in a collector of letting friends and admirers have full benefit of his collection more than the gratification of an egotistic desire to possess rare and beautiful things he saw in his artistic pursuits a great means of education and a help to the artists of his time according to the taste of his age lorenzo was very partial to greek and roman art to all that concerned past civilization a page of plato or the beautiful form of a greek marble aroused in him feelings of emotion more than any modern expression not only did he fill his palace with fine pieces of sculpture but his villas also appear to have been replete with them he was bursting with joy valori one of his contemporaries tells us when he received the bust of plato sent him by girolamo roscio this passion for the antique however did not prevent lorenzo from encouraging the artists of his own time or from taking a deep interest in their art eclectic in taste as a collector he nevertheless had some preferences in a letter to his son giulio the future leo x on his promotion to the cardinalate he gives advice as to the kind of art which is most in keeping with ecclesiastical taste but as a matter of fact epitomizes his own penchant as a collector of art urging his son to give preference to antique statuary 
he discourages him from becoming a collector of jewels, tapestries and embroideries. Love in preference, he recommends, fine antique things and books. Qualche gentilezza di cose antiche. Lorenzo the Magnificent seems to stand apart from the lovers of art of his time, not only on account of his culture and intelligence, his broad eclectic views and genuine cult of every expression of beauty, but as being a rare type of the grand seigneur, aesthete and humanist. Paul the Second is a passionate collector of art, but more a scholar than an artist, with him knowledge is supreme. Cardinal Scarampi is, as Ciriaco d'Ancona calls him, an archaeologist, and Niccoli, as an eager and intelligent searcher of objects, would make a good type of antiquary of our day. But Lorenzo displays interest in every kind of elevated human expression. His character seems to conform to his noble motto, Null ne sait qui ne sait. Nobody knows who does not try. His reputation as a connoisseur and expert in art spread afar. Princes and monarchs asked his advice. Lorenzo is not only prodigal in this respect, but also in the artistic things of his collection which he sends as presents. To Matthias Corvinus he sent a bust by Verrocchio. To the Count of Madaloni in Naples a fine horse's head now in the museum of that city, a rare piece of work which until lately was taken for Greek, but is now attributed to Donatello. The Duke of Calabria asks him for an architect, and he sends him one. In the year 1488, he sends to Ferdinand, King of Naples, a fine plan of a palace by Giuliano da Sangallo, and later he introduces Leonardo da Vinci to Lodovico il Moro, Filippino Lippi to Cardinal Carafa, Sansovino to the King of Portugal. In connection with odd requests that came to Lorenzo from princes and monarchs, there is a queer one from Louis XI. The French king asks the Magnificent to lend him for a while the miraculous ring of the Florentine patron saint San Zanobi, pledging himself to restore the ring to the owners, very likely the Girolami of Florence, and begging Lorenzo to tell him how and in what way it must be worn to perform the miracle, cure his gout, and restore him to health. Through his love of art and his munificence towards artists, Lorenzo became practically bankrupt, and certainly had no scruples about using public funds for his private purposes. Not that he was fond of personal display, on the contrary, he detested outlays that had no public utility and did not foster some progress. Rinuccini, another of his contemporaries, tells of Lorenzo's indifference to personal luxury and of his dislike for social functions. All the things that in the olden days, says Rinuccini, gave grace and reputation to the citizens like weddings dances and fates and handsome clothes he condemned them all and did away with them through his example and his words a detailed description of his character as a collector and the quality of his passion is not so eloquent of lorenzo's particular penchant as his recordi take for instance these words concerning his mission to rome at the elevation to the holy see of Cardinal de la Rovere. In the month of September 1471, I was sent as ambassador to attend the coronation of Pope Sixtus. I was the recipient of many honours in Rome and brought back from the city two antique busts, the portraits of Augustus and Agrippa, given to me by the Pope. I also brought with me the carved cup of Chalcedony and many cameos and medals. It must be said that in forming his collection, the Magnifico never lost sight of Rome and its treasures. He had many agents in the Eternal City excavating and looking for antiques to add to his collection. His intercourse with these accomplices, the ruses employed, the adroit management of influential prelates opposed to Lorenzo's schemes, and grieved that rare things should leave Rome, form an interesting character of diplomacy. Glyptography was given preference in Lorenzo's collection. 
some of his cameos and engraved precious stones are now the rarest things in our modern museums then came a fine collection of coins and medals twenty three thousand pieces in all and another of etruscan vases his statues which verrocchio and other artists were often charged to repair filled to overflowing his palazzo in florence and his villas to his assistants came not only special agents but friends as well a magnificent vase was obtained by lorenzo from venice and it was through the mediation of his literary friend poliziano that the rare find got into the magnifico's collection poliziano writes from venice to his friend and patron on june twentieth fourteen ninety one that messer zaccaria had just received from greece una terra cotta antiquissima and he believes it to be worthy of lorenzo's collection antonio ivan writing to donato acciaioli says that a little statue of hercules has been found at luni and that it and other antiques excavated are to be sent to lorenzo one of his agents sent him a marble statue with an etruscan inscription from siena lorenzo receives a bust that sends him into raptures and he immediately wishes to buy it to give an idea of his appreciation and willingness to pay whatever it might be worth we quote part of his letter dated may fifteenth fourteen ninety addressed to andrea da foiano then at siena ser andrea i received your letter last night and with it the head which you sent me and which on account of it being fine and having much of the antique beauty i would most willingly buy from him who owns it if he will part with it for what it is worth though there is no document to support the fact this bust is possibly the one that p della valle says was sent from siena to lorenzo representing a head of jupiter of such a character that beheld from one side that it had a benign expression and from the other a terrifying one naples also contributed its share to the medicean collection from whence arrive the portraits of faustina and scipio africanus a fine bust of hadrian and a sleeping cupid these last two statues were conveyed to him by giuliano da sangallo who under lorenzo's directions had asked them of the king of naples as a collector and type of antiquary not disdaining a good bargain and perhaps influenced by the lineage of shrewd bankers from which he sprang lorenzo made more than one good stroke of business from pope sixtus the fourth he managed to buy the artistic treasure of the holy see at such a ridiculous price as to arouse protests from the pontifical accountants the deal which was carried through by lorenzo's uncle giovanni tornabuoni caused a scandal that only the pope's authority managed to silence and the medici collection became enriched by many fine pieces among them the so-called tazza farnese now one of the finest pieces of the naples museum to which the inventory of the collection gives a value of ten thousand ducats and the rare greek work known as the rape of the palladium rated by the same inventory at the sum of one thousand five hundred ducats this celebrated cameo had formerly belonged to niccoli donatello copied it for one of his medallions of the medici palace there were other dealings between the medici and the holy see but we fail to know how advantageous they may have been for either side in the year fourteen sixty the medici sold a piece of tapestry to pope pius the second for the not inconsiderable sum of one thousand two hundred golden ducats and later on through the above quoted agent giovanni tornabuoni in the year fourteen eighty four several yards of common tapestry were sold to the pope by the medicis we have spoken at greater length of lorenzo il magnifico as he appears to us to symbolize the type of mycenas and collector of his epoch but all italian princes were more or less art lovers and collectors at that time as well as being shrewd bargain drivers on occasion as an example of this one is led straight to isabella d'esta 
and her hard dealings with Mantegna. Intelligent, keen-eyed and a good connoisseur, Isabella had set her heart on a Faustina Antica in the possession of the Paduan painter, but did not wish to pay the price demanded by the artist. Negotiations were carried on for quite a time. Knowing Mantegna's straitened circumstances, Isabella coolly and almost cruelly waited the favourable moment to take best advantage of the artist's distressing situation. Pressed by all sorts of needs, the aged artist finally decides to part with his best antique, the portrait of Faustina, a work he adored. Conscious of having served the house of Gonzaga most faithfully and knowing Isabella's intelligence and admiration for his bust of Faustina Antica, as he calls it, he determined to offer her the work for a hundred ducats. In his letter dated from Mantua, January 13th, 1506 he tells isabella all his troubles and how hard it is for him to part with his cherished bust but also how glad he would be if she will take it or as he says since i have to deprive myself of it i would rather you had it than any other lord or lady in the world to this pitiful letter ending with the touching appeal i recommend myself to your excellency many and many times Isabella replies later by sending one of her agents, whose letter to her is full of an astute spirit of bargaining, and runs as follows. In compliance with what your signoria writes me, I will call tomorrow on Messer Andrea Mantegna, and will act as shrewdly as possible about the Faustina. Farò l'opera con più destro e a concio modo saperò and will inform your excellency of the result at once giovanni calandra mantua july fourteenth fifteen o six a second letter from giovanni calandra informs isabella that the artist is obdurate as to the price that though he is in extreme need he hates to part with his faustina di marmo antica and asks pardon for the refusal that he hopes to find his price with Monsignor Vescovo di Gonzaga, who has the reputation, Calandra states, to be keen on these things. Dealings through the agent go on, till one day the latter announces to the Marchesa Isabella Gonzaga that she will become the possessor of the Faustina Antica, which is already shipped to her. Mando per Burchiello a posta la Faustina a essa vi. Provided she agrees to the price. If not, the agent begs that the bust be sent back, in accordance with his promise given to the painter, should the price not be agreed upon. A ciò possi disobligare le fede data a Messer Andrea Mantegna. Negotiations between Isabella Gonzaga and the penurious artist who had covered with glory the prince he had served and had decorated with magnificent frescoes the room of Isabella's mansion lasted from January 13th, 1506 to August 2nd of the same year. These are but a few incidents of the day. All Italy was collecting. Excitement over antiques had now become a mania and this is perhaps the best justification for imitators to have turned into fakers. At this period, art collecting ranged from its highest votaries, Lorenzo Medici, the Duke of Urbino, Esther, Gonzaga, Sforza, Aragona, down to common citizens who were earnest and intelligent collectors. One thing to be noted in this epoch is the total absence of the parvenu collector so fully represented in the roman period there may be an occasional case of snobbery like that of cardinal di san giorgio who refused to keep in his house an excellent imitation of michelangelo because though having deceived him and many others it was not actually genuine although far better than some of the rubbish in his collection which contained indiscriminately anything that had been unearthed in rome but a Tongilius, a Euctus, and above all, a Trimalco, do not seem to have existed in the Renaissance period. If they did, they were surely minor characters, and quite outside the world of real amateurs. End of chapter 7
Chapter Eight of the Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter Eight: Imitation, Plagiarism, and Faking. The artist's passion for the antique. Brunelleschi, Donatello, and their followers. Florence, the School of Padua, Venice. Imitation, Plagiarism, and Faking the plaquettes and their curious transformations of some greek and roman originals the character of the imitations and that of the intended victims there is no occasion here to lose oneself in arguments as to whether the artist was the primal cause of the awakening of the taste for the antique or whether it was a mere synthetic translation of a sentiment already awakened through complex causes the main one being perhaps classic literature Classicism, lately developed into an entirely pagan aesthetic sentiment, a combination of Philhellenic and Latin tendencies, may as well have influenced art as life in general, a sentiment that at the moment of its maturity aroused anathematic protest from Savonarola and a momentary reaction of pietism. However, the preaching of the friar and his colossal bonfire of art treasures in piazza della signoria were mere incidents in the course of florentine tendencies of art the piagnoni in florence may have converted botticelli and a few other artists but the pagan sentiment was not dispelled for the artists of the last part of the fifteenth century san giorgio and perseus were if not identical to be treated with the same artistic sentiment the real evolution in our opinion begins with brunelleschi and donatello in the year 1404 these two artists undertook a journey to rome for the progress of art this is a memorable date the real influence of greek and roman art on the artistic movement immediately preceding the renaissance begins at that date it is undeniable that even before this time mythological subjects had become familiar to both painters and sculptors artists preceding donatello and brunelleschi such as piero di giovanni tedesco Niccolò di Piero Lamberti, called Il Pella, and even Nanni and Antonio di Banco, show slight traces of Roman art at times, even to the way of working the marble, as in the ornaments of the north door of the Duomo in Florence by Giovanni Tedesco. But they are faint and uncertain traits, leaving one undecided whether they may be attributable to Roman influence or a mere inheritance from the Romanesque blunt-edged way of working the marble. The years spent in Rome by Donatello and Brunelleschi seem to have moulded the style of these two artists entirely anew, particularly that of the former the citizens of rome were more or less surprised at the persistency with which the two artists endeavoured to unearth fragments of old statues and supposing them to be animated by a mere mercenary hope that of finding some treasure they called the two students quelli del tesoro treasure seekers it is undeniably true that however profitable their search for old coins and marble relics their copies and study of ancient art were in the sum total more valuable than the solid gold they brought back with them to florence the results are plainly visible in brunelleschi's architecture and donatello's sculpture and the influence that their art exercised over their contemporaries and followers as we have said, after his sojourn in Rome, Donatello, particularly, seems to have immersed his art in a bath of past paganism. His art is no fakery, nor is it sheer plagiarism of the antique, but it is all permeated with Greek and Roman reminiscences, and comes at times so close to Greco-Roman art that it misleads connoisseurs. Speaking of Donatello's art, Louis Correggio, a well-known connoisseur observes he entered so deeply into the spirit of antiquity that some of his restorations of statues are very puzzling and it is difficult to distinguish his handiwork from that of the original in fact the famous horse's head of the naples museum was catalogued as a greek bronze before it was recently attributed to donatello or his school no one can fail to draw a comparison between donatello's putino and the infant with the goose a typical example of greco-roman art one of the first to be affected by the new sentiment in art was lorenzo ghiberti 
As a matter of fact, Ghiberti not only became enamoured of the antique, but was seized by the passion of collecting the best antiques in marble and bronze. You may be sure that collectors of this calibre, unlike the Roman samples, talked very little of patina and a great deal of form that their enthusiasm was of a higher alloy even than that of present-day collectors, who are rarely artists or even real lovers of art. Polycletus and Lysippus were Ghiberti's idols, and Greek art his worship. For the era of imperial Rome he had no enthusiasm. His cult for the Greek went so far as to induce him to reckon time by the Olympiads in his chronology. Instead of telling us that a certain artist died when Martin V was Pope, or in the year so-and-so, Ghiberti states amazingly that the event took place in the 438th Olympiad. It is not surprising that an artist like Ghiberti, and such a lover of Greek art as he was, should be able to classify Greek art at sight, to discriminate it from dubious Roman products, and all the art that so closely resembles certain Greek periods. That the worship of pagan art was practised by artists with no risk to themselves may be explained by the circumstance that the time of religious intolerance had passed. Intolerance, comprehensible perhaps in the early times of Constantine, when it was a crime for an artist to go to the forms of the past, had gradually sunk into tradition by the dawn of the new era which paved the way to the Renaissance in art and to humanistic tendencies, the most tolerant and unprejudiced period of past civilization. Lovers of art in this period appear to possess a certain refinement of feeling that the Romans did not have. They stand more as friends to the artist, esteem him more, and thus their pursuit has a wider scope. Even Ghiberti, with all the restrictions placed on his taste by his infatuation for the antique, was, according to Vasari who describes his collection, no narrow specialist in the so much praised modern meaning of the word, namely a collector who may be useful to the history of art and to knowledge at large, but who does not as a rule possess a spark of love for art or artistic feeling. As is often the case today, the heirs of these old collectors were at times more greedy for money than a reputation for art. Many fine collections were scattered to the four winds, which was also the fate meted out to Ghiberti's collection by his relatives and heirs. Fortunately, a few pieces of this stupendous collection have been saved. A fine torso of a satyr can now be seen at the Uffizi. There are other pieces too that have come down to us, but the finest works, those attributed to Polycletus, among them a rare ornamented vase, are now lost. The new artistic feeling perpetuated itself in architecture from Brunelleschi to Alberti. The latter built for Malatesta what purported to be a church, but which is in fact nothing but a temple to love, which the tyrant of Rimini erected and dedicated to the memory of his lady love, Isotta Atti. The revolution in sculpture affected by Donatello seems to have been felt in Padua and Venice. Imitations of all sorts and probably faked antiques date from this time. It is difficult to decide whether Donatello's genuine pagan sentiment, his second artistic nature, was solely due to his passion or to a desire to accommodate the general taste for the antique. Italian artists are far too versatile. However that may be, he was no faker. The art of the faker flourished when imitators had lost all artistic personality, becoming mere craftsmen catering as usual to a momentary mania. Then was the time one saw Filarete indulging in the most absurd medals and portraits of dubious, very dubious, historical correctness. Riccio in Padua fabricating and flooding the market with charming little bronzes in which the imitation is so evident that it brings up the question as to what the art of Andrea Briosco, called Il Riccio, might have been, had he chanced to be born at another epoch. Vellano also alternates fine pieces of work with little bronzes that must have been in great vogue with collectors of antiques. It is to be noted that the mania is not confined to Italy. It takes that country by storm because of its tremendous artistic activity and the fact that in art it is the foremost country of the time, but others were affected too. France is the first as being the nearest tributary to Italian supremacy in art. There are many examples of what we have said, but perhaps one of the most eloquent is the decoration of the castle of Gaillon, where there are some medallions with portraits of Roman emperors of a most mystifying character. 
Through the work of Italians at the end of the Quattrocento they were classified as antique, antiquai, only a few years later, at the beginning of the 16th century. An evident proof that Quattrocento imitations were not always directed by artistic fancy, but rather by the love of gain by means of fraud and fakery, is given by the fact that some of the statuettes imitating the antiques were cast with broken limbs. The Ambrus collection of Vienna has one of these curious specimens, a charming figure, a female nude. This piece has evidently been cast without arms, the clay model having been mutilated before the form was taken for the cast. In the Prado of Madrid, there is also a bronze statue of the Renaissance, possibly a cast from the antique, the peculiarity of which is that the arms have been added afterwards, as though in restoration. The metal of the arms is of a different alloy, and the modelling of these parts purports to be of a much later date than the rest of the statue. The first pieces to show a positive character of fakery are imitations of old coins and medals. Then small bronzes called plaquettes, often pastiches of antique models, were not actually reproductions from old cameos. The Renaissance has also produced many bronze statuettes that seem to have had no other purpose than to take in the amateur, to gratify his demand for antiques by launching spurious products upon the market. The artists responsible for them represent what might be styled the aristocracy of fakers. There is nothing banal about them, their work is generally good, so much so that these imitations have now acquired a value per se. Antonio Pulaiolo, the Florentine sculptor, is one of the most charming imitators of the antique. The flute player of the National Museum of Florence is perhaps one of the most convincing examples of this statement. Hercules and Antaeus is also a remarkable work by this artist, though the other is superior on account of its simplicity. Of the flute player, there are copies of the same period in the Cluny Museum and at Avignon. Curiously enough, this statuette tempted even the pencil of Raphael, who reproduced it in a sketchbook now kept in the Academy of Venice. As soon as he had left the goldsmith's shop, Andrea del Verrocchio, started the early period of his activity in his new career as a sculptor and made his way according to vasari by casting small figures in bronze we know very little of these small statuettes of verrocchio's beyond attribution but vasari says verrocchio was tempted to make them while in rome because he saw how appreciated were antique statuettes so much so that even fragments fetched fancy prices being an excellent craftsman with the chisel and skilled in the casting of metals, Verrocchio would seem to have been fully equipped for catering to the demand of the amateurs of his time. Vellano, in his imitations of the antique, seems at times to have even been tempted to counterfeit Egyptian arts. His art in imitating is eclectic and most versatile. Andrea Brisco seems to possess the brusque touch of some antique sculptors combined with the mania of Roman foppishness in overdraping his statuettes. They are invariably arrayed in gorgeous consular armour, elaborate togas, imperial sandals, and have, as a remarkable contrast, wild, vulgar faces in complete disharmony with the rich decoration of the costumes. However, when the artist models horses or simple nude figures, he gets closer to the original, and is evidently an excellent and dangerous imitator. The bronzes of the Paduan school that may, with more or less certainty, be attributed to Riccio, are endless, and in some of them the intention of faking is evident. Jacopo Sansovino, the presumed author of the bronze statuette of Meliaja of the Puteles collection in Berlin, does not seem to take the trouble to disguise the origin of his plagium. Michelangelo was too great a personality as an artist and too highly gifted to be tempted to hide his genius and waste his fine energies on imitation of the antique. Yet the story of his sleeping Cupid, sold in Rome as an antique, is very instructive. Though well known, it serves admirably to illustrate the character of the amateurs contemporary to the great sculptor. The anecdote casts a certain justified suspicion that the collectors of the Renaissance and early 16th century must have been duped on a larger scale than we are led to suppose from the scanty information we possess on the subject. 
Vasari informs us that Michelangelo sculptured from a piece of marble a life-sized sleeping Cupid, that in this work he had imitated the antique to a surprising extent, so much so that when the work was shown to Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de Medici, the latter advised the sculptor to send the work to Rome and sell it as an antique as, by this means, he could obtain a far better price. According to Vasari, the Cupid, marvellously arranged and coloured like an old piece of sculpture, was taken to Rome, buried in a vineyard, and then discovered and sold as an antique to Cardinal San Giorgio, who paid 200 ducats for the work. A ducat was worth about nine shillings. Vasari adds that the person who had acted as go-between in the affair tried to cheat Michelangelo by saying that the cardinal had only paid him 30 scudi, a scudi was worth about 4 shillings, and he then comments on the cardinal's poor taste in not giving the cupid due consideration after he had discovered that it was modern. He says, not recognising the merit of the work, which consists in perfection, wherein the moderns are as good as the ancients, the cardinal did not know how lucky he was to own a genuine work by Michelangelo in the place of heaven knows what poor product of some modest master of antiquity. Condivi repeats the story, which has given ample food for popular fancy and folklore, adding that the irate cardinal caused the man to be arrested and, giving him back the cupid, claimed and received the sum paid for it. The fact that Michelangelo, who went to Rome in the year 1496, wrote in July 1496, to Lorenzo di Pier Francesco di Medici that he had paid a visit to the Cardinal di San Giorgio shows that the prelate did not bear the artist a grudge for the joke. In this letter Michelangelo tells Lorenzo Medici that he has tried in vain to get the Cupid back from Baldassare Milanese, the dealer, and go-between in the affair of the Cardinal, but seeing that the man is obstinate in his refusal to give back the statue, he has been advised to use Cardinal San Giorgio's authority. Condivi says that in some unknown way this statue passed into the hands of Duke Valentino and finally became the property of the Marchioness of Mantua, who owned it at the time Condivi, the historian and Michelangelo's pupil, was writing. After the small statuettes, Roman busts are a source of some excellent imitations. Of these works, both in marble and bronze, many museums possess good examples. The Uffizi Gallery has two or three good ones. Besides these, the many restored busts and statues of this same gallery speak of the characteristic pliability and plagiarism in the art of the Renaissance. A fine bust in bronze of a hypothetical Roman emperor, formerly in the collection of Baron de Villiers, is now in the Louvre Museum. It is evidently the work of an artist of the versatile and prolific Paduan school. This very school of Padua, strengthened by the advent of Vittore Camelio, Cavino, De Bassiano, and other capable fakers of art, we feel we need not scruple to use the word in association with these names, is chiefly responsible for those coins, medals and small bronzes that it would be naive to say were made solely for the sake of imitating. The imitations of bas-reliefs prepared perhaps the popularity of those small bronze bas-reliefs called plaquettes, which seem to have meant so much to the collector of the time. We even find the angelic Mino, the last Renaissance artist who should have attempted to paganise his sweet aesthetic art, trying his hand at these marble bas-reliefs of Roman emperors, re-edited for the benefit of amateurs. These bas-reliefs already seem to have inveiled artists into palming them off with fantastic tales, giving them what might be called a shampoo of history. In the Brunswick Museum there is a bas-relief in marble, evidently aping antique art, representing an Aristotle in an absurd pointed headgear and with the following inscription Aristoteles o Aristos ton sic philosophon A replica of this bronze belonged to Charles Timble's collection and is now in the possession of Monsieur Gustave Dreyfus. A third with an identical inscription is kept in the Modena Museum. A fourth is in the Coro Museum of Venice, and finally, a fifth sample of this fantastic Aristotle is in the National Museum, the Bargello of Florence. It is certain that there was a companion piece to this Aristotle, the portrait of Plato, 
which has come down to us in material other than bronze, but which must have once been the pendant of the Aristotle, as there are clay reproductions of both portraits, the Aristotle being identical to the ones already quoted. Of Plato there are several bas-reliefs in marble, one in the Bavarian Museum of Munich, the other in the Museum of Arezzo, and another in the Prado. In the latter museum there is also an Aristotle in marble with its freakish head covering, long hair and a long beard. Of Plato there are two marble bas-reliefs, two medallions. In the larger one there is the inscription Platonos Athenio. A curious fact to be noticed is that of these two portraits Aristotle's must have caught public fancy more than that of his philosophical companion, not only because of the numerous reproductions of the one original, but because it must have been popular already in the time of Louis the Twelfth, being reproduced in clay in a medallion of the castle of Alouis at Blois. In this race for popularity in a foreign country, and from spurious origin, Plato seems to have lost nearly half a century, as we find a reproduction in the castle of Equin in the middle of the 16th century, which landed finally in the Museum of French Monuments, where Baltard renamed it as the portrait of Jean Boulon. No strange transition when one considers that a cast of the original Plato was, for quite a long time, shown in the Louvre as a portrait of Philibert de Lorme. The Louvre has a queer marble medallion, a work of the beginning of the 16th century, of a Roman Imperator Caldusius, and a medallion of Cato is now in the Museum of Beauvais. When Vespaciano de Bistici tells us that Niccoli had in his house an infinite number of medals in bronze and silver and gold, and many antique brass figures and many marble heads and other valuable things, we can believe that they were genuine. But when it is a question of a later collection of old marble heads, bas-reliefs and medals, we wonder how many an Emperor Caldusius it contained. This curious trade-in and mania for pastiche was assisted, it must be added, by the tremendous skill that the artists of all periods of the Renaissance seem to have possessed in moulding, recasting and composing one piece from two or three originals. We know that Verrocchio used to make plaster casts of living people, and the custom of making bust portraits and medallions from death masks was quite common in the Quattrocento and later. Such post-mortem reproductions were often ably disguised by the modelling stick, while other times they showed only too plainly their ghastly origin. A regular riot of fakery, combined with the most fantastic metamorphoses of Greek and Roman originals, existed for the benefit of crazy numistatists, greedy collectors of medals and amateurs with a fancy for small bronze bas-reliefs. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the imitation of coins was most varied. Some are quite excellent reproductions of the antique ones. Others again show the art and style of the artist and his period, but faintly disguised. Some of these latter are at any rate charming works of art. The coins, medals and small bronzes seem to emphasise the Renaissance media for the antique. Now, for instance, after giving the portrait of Adam, Eve, Noah and Ham, Shem and Japheth, the promptuarium iconum insigniorum a seculo hominum, published in Lyon by Guillaume Reville, 1553, gives other engravings purporting to be authentic portraits of various personages of antiquity. As a matter of fact, many of these portraits are copied from old medals that were circulating at the time, the work of the 15th and 16th centuries. Mr. Courageau, the former curator of the Louvre Museum, was able to prove this by finding some of the medals from which the portrait of the Promptuarium Iconum had been copied. These portray Antigone, the Lieutenant of Alexander the Great, the King of Phrygia, Lysimachus, king of thras the first an italian bronze of the 15th century is characteristic for the effort made by the artist to counterfeit the oriental style he may have noticed perhaps in other coins of the time but as we have said where the fancy of the faker really ran riot was in those small bronzes of various origin and still more varied purpose nowadays called plaquettes these bronzes were sometimes cast from the form of an old cameo 
at others they were imitated or aped a like origin and whether they may have been used as buttons pommels on the hilt of swords or simply been demanded by collectors they were for the most part imitations of the antique in these works the metamorphoses of the original are at times so numerous and so absurd as to puzzle the modern collector and cause him to speculate on the acumen of some of the connoisseurs of the past with some of these small bronzes the metamorphosis is not in the form but in the inscription that sometimes accompanies the plaquette but on other occasions the subject and the figures are considerably altered as an example of the former we may quote the supposed portrait of julius caesar of the Corrigeau collection in this case the plaquette bears the inscription julius c p p p m which has caused the wrong naming of this bas relief for an identical plaquette formerly in the collection of mr bardini of florence seems to indicate that it must be a question of cicero the second inscription runs thus m tullius c p p p m as for the second method the alteration of the form and subject of a plaquette the fancy displayed by the makers borders upon the grotesque to begin with a mild form of metamorphosis let us follow the subject of apollo and marcius in its transformation from the original cameo that was in the collection of lorenzo il magnifico and according to Muntz, is now in the naples museum together with many others from the same collection in this cameo the god is on the right playing the lyre held in his left hand marcius to the left has his hands tied behind him between the two figures kneels olympus a pupil of marcius interceding for his doomed master the supposed original in the naples museum bears but one inscription law med evidently standing for lorenzo medici but ghiberti tells us that on this cornelian around the said figures were antique letters spelling the name of nero there is nothing strange in this nor in the presupposition that the cameo had been nero's private seal as one knows he was fond of playing the lyre but what casts some doubt on the authenticity of the naples cornelian stone is the fact that the berlin museum possesses a bronze plaquette evidently a reproduction from some antique cameo with the inscription to which ghiberti alludes nero augustus germanicus p m t r p imp p p the cornelian stone kept in the naples museum has no inscription and for this reason is supposed by some to be a reproduction from the original ordered by lorenzo medici the plaquette of the berlin collection is thought to be cast from the original greek cornelian stone though there are other reproductions in various museums one for instance in the louvre very similar to the one of berlin another in the collection of corrigio with the inscription prudentia puritas tertium quod ignoro mr corrigio also owns two more copies of this subject one similar to the one in the louvre with the addition of a border the other of larger dimensions with the figure resting on a ground in the form of a crescent a bas-relief of this subject used as an ornament of the pommel of a sword hilt and very similar to the other plaquettes was in the de villiers collection n schlieffer and giovanni boldu fourteen fifty seven treated the favourite subject with a certain plagiarism of the greek model in boldu's bas-relief apollo is in the usual attitude but the other figure has disappeared there are many other plaquettes with small variations in private collections there is also a plaquette of this subject in the draper's collection in which apollo has become a woman and marcius is playing the flute evidently the subject must not only have been popular among collectors but must have caught the fancy of artists as the composition of apollo and marcius is reproduced in the bas relief of a fine door formerly of cremona and now in the louvre museum the one at naples is repeated almost identically in a cornelian of the cabinet de medaille in a portrait of a young girl attributed to botticelli in the stadel museum of frankfurt on the frontispiece of the work executed for matthias corvinius on a frontispiece of the sforzade that rare work kept in the library of the riccardi in florence on a majolica dish of the fifteenth century now in the Corra museum in venice there is a plagiarism of this subject in a work by raphael in the vatican 
The following examples, however, are perhaps more typical of an intentional transformation, a somewhat reversed case and an exception to the rule in this sort of faking, namely a Christian subject turned into a pagan one for the benefit of the 15th century amateurs. There still exist in San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome two bas-reliefs representing two incidents in the life of the saint who has given the church its name, one when he is arrested and put to prison, the other when he is chained in his cell and liberated by the angels. The two bas-reliefs, wrongly attributed to Pulaiolo, were ordered from some Roman artist in the year 1477 by Sixtus IV, then a simple cardinal. Of each of these bas-reliefs there is a modified reproduction, one in the Louvre and the other in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the modifications of both are such as to make people believe them to be pagan subjects and antique work. In the reproduction kept in the Louvre, the transformation of the subject without much alteration of the work is so evident that we can see how easily old collectors were taken in by these curious pieces of trucage. Of a more naive but no less efficient character is the transformation inflicted upon the bas-relief of Kensington. Here, in order to transform the miraculous liberation of St. Peter into the freeing of a Roman senator, it has sufficed to clip the angel's wings, both inside the prison, the work being divided into two different moments of the action, and where the saints usher the apostle into the street. There is no reason to disbelieve the supposition that this piece of faking was perpetrated to cater for the mania of the art lover of the time. As a matter of fact, the Louvre bas-relief was considered an antique till but recently, and that of the Victoria and Albert Museum, which entered the collection wrongly labelled as the work of Ghiberti, was believed before 1863, when it was acquired by the museum, to be a work of the classic Greco-Roman period. As for over three centuries they have passed as genuine work of the Roman Empire, it is not reasonable to suppose that the amateurs of the time were wiser than the succeeding generations of connoisseurs who believed the work to be antique. This fact is eloquently brought out in the case of the work preserved in the Louvre, as this bas-relief was not hidden but has quite a long and well-established pedigree. Among other migrations, we can trace it to Malmaison in a sort of select collection of objects coming from Italy. Edmi Durand bought it as an antique, and in the belief that it was antique, kept it in his collection. The Louvre Museum also bought it for an antique, and for quite a long time classified it in the catalogue, number 280, as an Etruscan bronze. It would take too long to trace all the transformations of small bronzes made for the benefit of the 15th and 16th century amateurs, the many reproductions were changes. Of the metamorphoses to which plaquettes were subject, we can mention another curious example in which a crucifixion has become a rape of the Sabines. And as a case in which a popular subject has caused many reproductions, we quote the palladium of the Nicoli collection, which has been reproduced by Donatello, Niccolò Florentino, etc. The statue of Marcus Aurelius also seems to have been a cherished subject for small statuettes from that by Filarete given to Piero Medici in the year 1465 to reproductions of the 17th century. Of all the workmen of that fertile period running between the 15th and 16th centuries, Moderno was the most active and versatile. There is hardly a mythological subject that has not been treated by him. His imitation of the antique is at times quite convincing, more especially that belonging to the early period of his career. Later on, when he enters into what might be styled his matured 16th century temperament, he seems to suffer from the same trouble as the imitators of the first third of the same century, namely over-polish and mannerism, which must in fact have been considered an improvement in imitation. Valerio Belli, a sculptor and famous cutter of precious stones and rock crystal, was quite justified in reproducing the subject of his own carving in the small bronze bas-reliefs that now play such an important part in modern collection of plaquettes, and which in times gone by must have been the delight also of past collectors. They often bore his signature, which speaks eloquently for the fact that there was no intention to dupe anyone. There were also other artists who evidently had a hand in faking antiques. They belong more or less to various schools, but chiefly to those of Padua and Venice. 
The Paduan school is in this respect fortified by the names of Vittore Camillo, Cavino, Bassiano. Almost every bronze founder is associated with an imitator of the antique, either a maker of statuettes, inkstands, perfume vases or plaquettes of various sizes and use. Thus, for a second time, Italy became a gorgeous market of imitation, very often in itself such good art as to be worthier than the art counterfeited. One of the last of these imitators was Tiziano Aspetzi, to whom, rightly or wrongly, small bronzes of private collections are attributed. From the Anonimo Moreliano, one gathers that there was a period in which a gentleman could hardly afford to do without a little collection of antiques. The bronze figurines are modern by various masters and are derived from the antique, remarks this Anonimo of Morelli, as though explaining that there were some collectors perfectly satisfied with this and perhaps the silent accomplices of a fine piece of faking. The Anonimo tells us that there were many such pieces in the collections of either ignorant or accommodating collectors and art lovers in the house of Marco Bonavido of Padua, and that of a rich merchant of the same city, the sculptor Aviso, in Venice, in the collections of Adoni and Zuano Ram. They are often mingled with genuine antiques, which causes the Anonimo, who evidently thinks himself either a connoisseur or a well-informed chronicler, to say here or there, the many bronze figurines are modern, or the many medals are of modern bronze, or the medals are most of them antique. Precious confessions, as one can see. We know but vaguely of imitations in painting, but an assembly of such versatile artists can hardly have refrained from imitating the work of some master. Besides, the very teacher at the head of a school did not seem to resent it even if a pupil signed the name of his master. But as regards imitating the antique, there were hardly any samples to imitate. The grotesques of the old Roman ruins may have suggested to more than one artist a new type of decoration. But this plagiarism, if it can be called so, though not without influence on 15th and 16th century art, found no practical issue with fakers. There is, however, an incident in which a piece of faking saved to Florence a masterpiece of Raphael. It is related by Vasari in Aldrea del Sarto's life. According to Vasari, when Frederick II, Duke of Mantua, came to Florence, he greatly admired the portrait of Pope Leo X. The magnificent painting now hanging in the gallery of the Pitti Palace in Florence. His admiration turned to such greedy desire of possession that when he reached Rome he begged the then all-powerful Clement the Seventh to procure it for him. The Pope agreed to the Duke's request and ordered Ottaviano Medici, then residing in Florence, to have the painting packed and sent to Mantua to Duke Frederick. Ottaviano Medici, a lover of art and a Florentine, hating to deprive a city of such a work, was yet not inclined to resist the wish of the Pope and resorted to a ruse. He informed the Pope that the painting should be sent to the Duke, according to His Holiness's order, as soon as the frame had been repaired. The Duke of Mantua was also informed that the frame needed regilding and that the painting should be shipped as soon as the repairs were finished. With this excuse, Ottaviano Medici gained the necessary time and ordered from Andrea del Sarto an exact copy of Raphael's work, a copy that all experts would mistake for the original. The work was done to such perfection that even Ottaviano Medici, who was an art connoisseur, could not tell the original from the copy. The pseudo-Raphael was sent off, the Duke was duped and one of the finest portraits by Raphael was saved to Florence. In Vasari there are comments here and there which lead us to think that many others may have been duped by the versatility of the 15th and 16th century painters. We know that Bellini's pupils finished three quarters of some of the great Venetian masters' works, that Calchar imitated Titian so well as to be taken for the great Vicelli, but we do not know to what extent lovers of art of this time may have been duped. As for sculpture, we may close this study by quoting what Vasari writes in the life of Villano. So great is the power of counterfeiting with love and care any object that, more often than not, 
if the style of one of these arts of ours be well imitated by those who delight in the work of whoever it be the thing that imitates so closely the thing imitated that no difference can be detected except by the most experienced eye of ghiberti a collector and versatile sculptor vasari tells that he took much pleasure in imitating the dyes of ancient coins and medals which comment amply justifies the observation that the learned milanese adds to the life of valerio belli who at times according to vasari forgot to add his signature and was extremely clever in counterfeiting antiques from which ability he derived very great benefit antique medals says milanese were very much in demand about this time consequently forgers and imitators abounded they had in fact multiplied to great numbers and fostered the art of counterfeiting to its highest perfection end of chapter eight chapter nine of the gentle art of faking by ricardo nobili this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jordan watts oxfordshire chapter nine collectors of the sixteenth century collectors of the sixteenth century character of the time and the artist's attitude towards the antique cellini restores antique statues new roman masterpiece discovered in rome decadence of art a protest of raphael against daily destruction of roman relics first laws prohibiting exportation of roman finds barbaric attitudes of a barberini first law against the exportation of painting masterpieces as we have already observed centuries in art cannot be separated like horses into stable boxes there are periods between one change and another transitional times that make it impossible to fix any date whatsoever thus we may say without stating a date that the sixteenth century not only felt the benefit of the quattrocento for a certain time but was itself actually quattrocento for a score of years or more the men of the past had not vanished riccio for instance one of the most active imitators of the antique died in fifteen thirty three but when the sixteenth century began to outline its own character the cult of art art patronage and the passion for collecting fine things are seen to have taken another turn the cinquecento has of course magnificent patrons of art and almost every prince collects something or other life is still imbued with partiality for the antique lorenzino medici in playing brutus and actually killing his cousin duke alexander medici is reconstructing an old heroic attitude in his learned pagan mind filippo strozzi or whoever planned his suicide makes one think of some hero of plutarch when he is found dead apparently by his own hand with a line of virgil exuriare oliquis nostris ex ossibus ultor may an avenger arise from my bones written in his own blood at his side painting still deals with subjects from roman history and so does sculpture but artists have lost all comprehension of them a fact still more evident with regard to biblical subjects in support of this statement it is sufficient to quote the painting of paolo veronese now in the academy at venice representing jesus in the house of levi one of the artist's masterpieces in which christ is in the company of venetian gentlemen of the sixteenth century but if in this painting disregard for the oriental side of the scene is carried to an extreme it must be said that titian and tintoretto and a great many other painters of the time were no better this trait which certainly originated in the good period of the renaissance and which we now find in its full development indicates that in its most significant and ripest expression the cinquecento is the logical decline of a past triumph in art the victim as it were of tradition of tradition and a few artistic personalities such as raphael and michelangelo who turned a new leaf in art awakened a new feeling a new overpowering school michelangelo especially with his fascinating and inimitable style draws a legion of followers fostering an art that during the great sculptor's life already is ripe for decadence enlightened collectors abound in this period their collections increase daily but are they really lovers of art as their predecessors were are they worshippers of the antique like the bygone collectors 
this is what we ask in the 16th century when art is a tradition of the far past on the one hand and on the other almost a tradition of the recent past life seems to have taken the self-same attitude people are not real lovers of art but are so merely by tradition every well-bred gentleman of the cinquecento was obliged to have the air of understanding art machiavelli might have added an interesting chapter to his principe to demonstrate how important it was for a prince to be interested in art even though perchance utterly indifferent to it in reality when giving instructions to his cortegiano as to what a gentleman of his time ought to know castiglione adds that he must learn to paint even if this art affords you no pleasure advises castiglione it will give you a better understanding of things and a clearer appreciation of the excellency of ancient and modern statues vases monuments medals cameos carvings and other such objects in a word ably or otherwise with natural disposition or not it was part of good breeding for a gentleman of the sixteenth century to be interested in art and play the connoisseur it is from this that the cinquecento suffers the patent prince patron of art the stock gentleman collector abounds the genuine lover of art is rare a prince's house or that of a simple person of good standing was considered incomplete if without a collection of some sort yet while the artists of the sixteenth century had certainly derived no small benefit from their predecessors passion for the antique they had become far too individual far too engrossed in their own art to be susceptible to the art of the past michelangelo the artist who lived practically through both centuries the sculptor whose genius tremendous and over individual was nevertheless responsible for the decadence of sculpture is a good example of this he can like many other italian artists show his versatility and skill by imitating an art other than his own as he did with the sleeping cupid that deceived cardinal san giorgio but when the artist is genuine and gives his own artistic temperament full play craft and virtuosity disappear reminiscence is impossible even when the subject and peculiar quality of the work suggest imitation and turn thought to the antique michelangelo remains true to his own grand soul his brutus exemplifies the point it was a roman subject of classical times and michelangelo might easily have been infected by the history of the past and the forms he had admired when interested in the excavation of ancient statues in rome yet his brutus is more dante-esque in its tragic lines than roman cellini to illustrate another aspect is a different case he can repair antiquities for his patron cosimo medici fairly well but he also is too highly individual to make an excellent imitation of the antique he tells us that he consented to repair his illustrious patron's ganymede because it was a fine greek work and prone as he is to self-praise he tells how stupendously he can do it but he does not like such work he calls it arte de ciabattini cobbler work the fact however is that he is too much alive to his time has too strong an expression of his own art to be skilful in imitations in fact it happened that he had to try his hand at a portrait of cosimo the first in the guise of a roman emperor the portrait of the grand duke of tuscany will never deceive any art simpleton in spite of its elaborate cuirass fit for augustus cellini is too delightfully cinquecentesque the same may be said of him as a medalist yet in some of cellini's work especially his medals the idea of imitating the romans must have been in his mind and no doubt he was convinced of his success yet he belonged to the group that by their personality influenced others and when trying his hand at imitation quite congenial to his own artistic temperament he makes something that is at least three-quarters cellini these artists nevertheless admire the art of the past though with no dangerous of infection michelangelo is entranced when the laocoon is discovered in a vineyard near the thermi of titus and goes with his friend sangalo to see that the precious statue be carefully unearthed partly for the sake of gain and partly maybe for the love of art cellini often goes to the roman campagna to see what certain lombard yokels have uncovered in their daily spading of the soil raphael protests in a famous document addressed to leo x against the continual destruction of roman relics his words are worth repeating 
after declaring that the goths and vandals had not done so much damage to rome as his contemporaries raphael concludes by saying that far too many popes have allowed roman edifices to be ruined simply by permitting the excavation of pozzolana clay from the ground upon which their foundations rest that statues and marble ornaments are daily burned in ovens and turned into mortar that rome in fact the rome of raphael's time is built with naught but mortar made from old statues the sacred marbles of past glories characteristic also is the fact that this country sees the first protective laws against the exportation of antique art this would seem to indicate the consideration in which relics of past art were held in rome judging by the way it was applied however even this act serves to show that there was no more genuine a passion for old and precious antiques in the cinquecento than in the century before the roman laws of the sixteenth century are severe meting out punishment to all and sundry daring to carry the produce of excavations beyond the papal domains but otherwise destruction goes on gaily there seems to be no discrimination as to what ought to be saved from the doom of destruction and what is not worth keeping so while edict after edict is promulgated in order to safeguard the excavation of statues in rome and elsewhere edicts are often full of old-fashioned magniloquence prohibition concerning the exportation of marble or metal statues figures antiquities and such like the best buildings in rome were allowed to fall into utter ruin without a protest the state of things reached the climax of absurdity in the seventeenth century when urban the eighth of the barberini family declared the Colosseum a public quarry where the citizens might go for the stones they needed for new constructions an act still commemorated in the protest of all lovers of art with the proverbial pun quod non fecerunt barberi fecerunt barberini what the barbarians did not do the barberini did from this curious inconsistency in the appreciation of art even tuscany the cradle of the renaissance is not immune a medician law intended like the roman one to prevent the exportation of masterpieces and rare works of art makes no mention of precious relics of roman or etruscan origin nor even of the fine pieces of sculpture that were often excavated but considers only the paintings of certain artists of the past school of the renaissance and those of other contemporary artists as being worth keeping so the law declares for the glory and dignity of florence the regulations are given in a second decree along with a list of the names of the artists concerned dead and living their work must not be taken out of tuscany the list is very instructive for it passes over some of the best artists such as botticelli credi the polaiolos and others and prohibits the export of the work of artists that are either unknown to us or are of such mediocrity that it is surprising their work should have been esteemed above the average of their day the following is one of these lists the first that was made one michelangelo buonarotti two raffaello da urbino three andrea del sarto four meccarino Five, Il Rosso Fiorentino. Six, Leonardo da Vinci. Seven, Il Franciabigio. Eight, Perino de Vaga. Nine, Jacopo da Puntormo. Ten, Tiziano. Eleven, Francesco Salviati. Twelve, Angelo Bronzino. Thirteen, Daniello da Volterra. Fourteen, Fra Bartolomeo di San Marco della Porta. Fifteen, Fra Bastiano del Pombo. Sixteen, Filippo di Fra Filippo. Seventeen, Antonio da Correggio. Eighteen, Il Parmigianino without insisting upon a comment that might appear paradoxical what kind of collectors of art can be expected from the people who place in the same list of merit leonardo michelangelo titian with cecchin salviati perino del vaga to say nothing of the now forgotten meccarino a painter whose well-deserved oblivion saves us from judging his poor work in another list other names are added 
they are no less grotesque. Santi di Tito Ligozzi, Jacobo de Empoli, etc., in far too good company. End of chapter 9chapter ten of the gentle art of faking by ricardo nobili this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jordan watts oxfordshire chapter ten collecting in france and england passion for collecting art travels to france the florentine republic and the fate of a statuette by michelangelo italy supplies antiques to france and other countries the fair of frankfurt a famous sale in england the passion for collecting art and curios may have originated in france while the passion in italy for collections of art still goes on enriching museums more through the impetus of the past than from a genuine cult and produces occasionally together with many illustrious patrons of contemporary art some old type of collector fond of the antique with the characteristic greed for all kinds of rarities france and later almost every other nation of europe awakens to the passion for art and curios it is no longer a question of monarchs and princes as was the case in italy nobles and the bourgeois as well come to the fore even at the beginning of the sixteenth century france may quote the names of grolier and robertet both financiers employed at court both lovers of fine things the former is a specialist in rare editions and fine bindings the latter a keen-eyed eclectic collector as may be gathered from the inventory of his excellent collection kept in his castle at bury it must be said however that italy still remains a sort of el dorado of fine art and the inexhaustible mine to which collectors come for their finds the french had discovered this fact from the time they came to italy with charles the eighth later on grolier visits italy and takes back with him some of its treasures when he has no opportunity to come to italy himself his friends and agents continue the search for him they know his taste and his speciality and are very alert in the hunt for fine and rare editions robertet bargained with the florentine republic to exchange his political influence for a statuette by michelangelo the republic had great interest in remaining friends with the french monarch and accepted the bargain and as the statuette had been left unfinished by michelangelo who had moved to rome by this time benedetto da robertiano is charged to finish the work and cast it this statuette of a david was placed by robertet in the corps d'honneur of his castle and afterwards in the year sixteen thirty three removed to the castle of villeroy and it is now lost only a design of this statue by the great michelangelo is now in the louvre museum and from this we can gather how the statue looked what was not bought was carried away from italy after the fashion of the old roman conquerors in the year fifteen twenty seven a ship arrived at valencia loaded with artistic and valuable booty from the famous sack of rome curiously enough considering the age the spanish municipal authorities of valencia did not grant the vessel permission to unload her cargo this fact quoted by baron de villiers in his histoire des finances espagnoles mauresques is commented on by edmund bonafé a french collector of our times thus i love to think that the captain changed his course and found more hospitable municipalities on the french coast the rich artistic booty promised by italy made it almost obligatory for an orthodox french amateur to undertake a journey to italy it is surprising that the voyage du montagne en allemagne et en italie fifteen eighty to eighty one makes no allusion to this fad and contains very few comments on art however rich montaigne's work may be in the valuable observations on the life of the time we should nevertheless have desired him to have a touch of the art lover in him a leaning to the artistic and beautiful and we would willingly have exchanged a few words with him on the art and collections of art in the italy of his day instead of his long detailed descriptions of his cures and eternal search for medicinal springs etc an important annual meeting one that the true collector was likely to visit was the fair of frankfurt according to h estienne this must have been one of the most frequented art markets of europe italy says estienne contributed all kinds of antiques faiences old medals books and brocades 
Germany furnished wrought iron and artistic prints, Flanders sent tapestry, Milan its fine arms, Venice goods from the east. Estienne also states that Spain used to send to this fair American products, weapons, costumes, shells and silverwork. It was not a market exclusively for the genuine, as copies and imitations were to be found there for the economical or the foolish, easily duped amateur. Above all, there were those deplorable casts from fine originals that have ever since deceived so many collectors and which so enraged the good palissy, who laments the fact and stigmatises it with the saying that it cheapens and offends sculpture. Mespirons les sculptures à cause de la merie. This glimpse of the creation of a market of antique art and bric-a-bracs of high quality would not be complete without some typical sale of a famous collection. Among others that took place towards the end of the 16th century, we may quote a notable one, the sale of Claude Gauffier, seigneur de Boissy, duc de Rennes and grand écuyer de France. An intelligent gentleman who, with his mother Hélène de Arges Jeanly, is responsible for one of the finest types of French pottery, the faience d'Oiron. Besides spending considerable sums of money on the factory of this ware, Goffier was such a liberal patron of art and artists that he ruined himself in the gratification of his noble passion. After his death, the creditors seized upon his rare collections and objets de vertu and put them up to auction. This sale was not only the artistic event of the day, but, perhaps, the most important sale of the second half of the 16th century. All Paris at the time seems to have been there. Plates, paintings, works of art, bibliots, toute la curiosité, passed mercilessly under the hammer of the auctioneer, which, by the way, was not a hammer, a usage originating in England, but as a rule a barguette, a small rod, with which the auctioneer struck a metal bowl. Nothing was spared by the creditors, even the wearing apparel and furs of the deceased were offered to the highest bidder. Of these, strange to say, the Duc de Moule, Claude de Lorraine, third son of Claude, first Duc de Guise, bought a second-hand manteau de ceremonie with the evident intention of wearing it at court. By a complete coincidence, this sale took place only 25 days after the tragic night of St. Bartholomew, September 18th, 1572, an event that did not prevent Catherine de Medici from appearing at the sale with her ladies-in-waiting to dispute with other buyers the spoils of the deceased gentleman. One of the conspicuous buyers at this auction was a Florentine living in Paris, Luigi Ghiacetti, called by the Frenchman Le Seigneur d'Agesse, or d'Ajout. Besides un arnois d'homme d'arme complet grave et droit à moresque, he bought many things, the portrait of Henry II, and also 60 pictures painted in oils. This Florentine was not only an esteemed collector of his time, but a man of taste who had built one of the finest mansions in Paris, which he showed to visitors, together with his fine museum, for a sou, so says Sauval, the chronicler quoted above. While France appears to have been the first country to follow Italy in the artistic movement, about this time, as we have said, all European nations had more or less perfected their taste and acquired the love for art collecting. The English invasion of France is perhaps responsible for the awakening of this passion in England. Wharton, History of Poetry, Volume 2, page 254, is of the opinion that after the Battle of Cressy, 1346, the victorious army brought home such treasures that there was not a family in England, modest though it might be, that did not own some part of the precious booty, furniture, fur, silk stuffs, tapestries, silver and gold works, etc., the pillage of the French cities. More than two centuries later, part of this artistic booty may have come back to France. Gilles Croiset tells us that on the Megisserie, the quay constructed by Francis I, where artistic sales usually take place, in the year 1550, in the month of August, there were publicly sold at the Magistry several images, altarpieces, paintings and other church ornaments which had been brought and saved from the churches of England. Imitation and faking do not seem to find suitable patrons at this time. Collectors are cold and methodical, and a well-established commerce in antiques and abundance of objects offered for sale seem to have precluded a demand for other fakes than those of the past, and a few clumsy imitations. 
the imitations of this period are hardly convincing restorers of the antique were without skill which fact plainly tells that their patrons were not excessively particular they were satisfied with a roman bust repaired by a sculptor who does not give himself the trouble to disguise his own art about the time of which we are speaking that is to say when the merits and demerits of the sixteenth century had delineated themselves and had reached the summit of the curve that anticipates decline the work of michelangelo raphael and a few others if there were any others of that calibre produced their natural effect to be a sculptor meant to copy all the defects of michelangelo to indulge in overripe forms turgid muscles and exuberance in general to be a painter did not mean so much civility because raphael's influence was less extended but very few escaped imitating or recalling the painting of the fine master of urbino more especially as the public was naturally attached to raphaelite traditions this was so much the case that not only was giulio romano accepted and a legion of other painters who aimed more or less successfully to imitate raphael but later the honour that should have belonged to raphael was given to Sogliani simply because he had deceived the public by his craft and virtuosity winning the name of raphael reincarnated in our opinion part of the energy that was keenly given in olden times to the imitation of the antique was now bestowed on faking it is true that france was coming to the fore about the middle of the sixteenth century with indisputable superiority in art while italy turns to inevitable decadence france had had a school of fontainebleau disposed to exercise the tyranny of genius but rosso was not raphael and the italian influence though of great benefit to the french school was after all a mere passing incident in the course of art in that country yet it is surprising that even in france at a moment when the mania for collecting art was on the increase the collector does not seem to have been either victimized or annoyed by faking it must be said though with edmund bonnefe that the french buyers were regarded somewhat as novices and everyone did his best to exploit them the french art lover with all his progress and enlightenment was at this time naive and easily exploited by trickery it is easy to imagine that if faking did not become as rampant as before it must have been because it did not pay as formerly yet h estienne remarks on this subject today the world is full of buyers of old lumber antiquai, at whose expense many rogues are prospering for so little do they know how to distinguish the antique from the modern that no sooner do they hear the word which so often makes them dip their fingers into their purse etc by this remark even without other documents one is entitled to conclude that even at this period which seems to have been less given than the others to imitation and faking victims existed and were ready like the novice or the unwise today to pay fancy prices supported by a name although ranking second in the movement of art france england and germany have risen up and improved their taste indulging in the true patronage of art italy is still the inexhaustible source of antiques in spite of the fact that the decadence afflicting the country had destroyed the real love of art in the collector italian villas and palaces are replete with paintings the best often in garrets the bad art of the time in full honour in the important rooms the barocco with its gorgeous errors and few merits is about to prepare the funeral of italian art the seventeenth century is approaching end of chapter ten